Hey everybody, welcome back to Retro Mining News, my weekly video where I talk about what's new and upcoming in the world of retro console mining. First up this week, Tim Ville has released a new version of the Triple Controller. The Triple Controller is a USB controller adapter that allows you to use NES, Super Nintendo, and Sega Genesis controllers on a computer, a Raspberry Pi, or even on a Mister. The V2 version adds support for the NES PowerPad and the SNES NTT controllers, and the PCB is now ENIG plated. The triple controller is available here on Tindy in two different setups. You can either get a fully assembled triple controller or you can buy a DIY kit if you wanna save a little bit money and solder it together yourself. If you wanna learn more about the triple controller, I have a video where I assembled and reviewed the version one of the triple controller. I'll leave a link to that video in the description below. Zaxor has been hard at work behind the scenes working on an update to the Sega Genesis triple bypass mod. Over here on his GitHub, it looks like he's calling this the triple bypass v2 plus which is supposed to be a variant of tian fong's uh, v2 version of the triple bypass it looks like the two main upgrades to the triple bypass v2 are headphone audio restoration he's added some new pads onto the triple bypass board that you can bridge over to the section on a model one if you want to re-enable the headphone jack in the front. And the second improvement is that he's restored composite video to the DIN on both a model one and a model two. Now there's some extra setup that you have to do to enable this composite for different versions and you can check out the description here. But it's interesting that you can now re-add the, I guess, disabled composite video if you wanted to do some comparisons between the RGB and the composite video. So if you're interested in doing this triple bypass V2 Plus, you can come over to this GitHub here and where you can find the Gerbers and the build materials so that you can put one together yourself. Next, we have a pretty interesting post from LaserBear. It seems like LaserBear and Voltar are working together to create a no-cut version of their multi-out for the NES RGB. This is specifically for the NES front loader. And if you look at this picture here, it looks like they're trying to route the wiring for the multi-out through the expansion port and that little channel in the bottom of the NES. And if you look at this picture here, you'll notice that the multi-out is actually coming out kind of at a 90 degree angle instead of straight out. Any cables that you have plugged into the multi-out will now be more flush to the back of the NES. I think this is a pretty awesome idea and it sounds like it will be able to take advantage of Voltar's quick solder board thing with the flex cables, although you will need a longer flex cable to uh, plug this multi out into the NES RGB with that flex cable kit. However, there is one thing that I don't like about this and that is that it takes up the expansion port in the bottom of the NES. I know a lot of things, actually I don't know of any accessories for the original NES use that expansion. However, that's not to say that people won't come out with expansions in, this, in the future that will be for the original NES. For example, Miramasa is working on a Famicom disk system add-on thing for the NES. So basically if you wanted to use this, you'd have to choose over doing this or that no cut multi out thing from Voltar. So that's the only downside that I see. I wish there was still a way for you to be able to plug in stuff into the expansion and still get a no cut multi out experience, but that's really my only gripe. If you haven't noticed, I don't really talk that much anymore about Mr. Stuff here on the channel. I tend to work on like original consoles and covering that sort of thing. However, once in a great while, there is some really awesome stuff with the Mr. Scene that I'd like to cover here too. And this week it is this 24 bit color for Asm FPG's PS1 Mr. Core. I think the screenshot here where he was announcing that it's gonna be in the public beta thing for the PlayStation 1, these top down pictures here, it's hard to tell the difference between the normal color for the PS1 and this new 24 bit. But basically the idea is it does away with the dithering that you get with the PlayStation 1. So here in the sky, you can see some very harsh dithering above these trees over here. And in the 24-bit version, you can see it's a very smooth gradient between the different colors in the sky. However, earlier in the week, as an FPG showed off these pictures from Silent Hill, and I think that the side-by-side -side comparisons here are pretty striking. Over here on the top left, as you get higher and like further into the fog here in Silent Hill, you can see that very apparent dithering effect. But here in the 24-bit version, the gradient of colors is very smooth. I think that this is an awesome update and anybody who uses the PS1 Mr. Core is gonna love using this 24-bit color. Here we have a little sneak peek from Voltar about an upcoming mod that I think is gonna be very exciting for a lot of people. Now, before I talk about what I think this mod is gonna be, I think we should head over to RetroRGB's website and check out some things first. Here we are on the SNES version comparison page on RetroRGB's website. 
If we scroll down a little bit, we can see some comparisons between two chip SNESs and one chip versions. Now from left to right here, you can kind of see like a very noticeable difference between the version on the far right is the Super Nintendo Junior with an RGB bypass mod and the original RGB video from a two chip SNES. Don't get me wrong, I, I think that there's a bunch of complexity in this article. If you wanna read more about just the various model comparisons and stuff, feel free to check out this article. Just know that there are some versions of the Super Nintendo while they do natively output RGB, they are not gonna be as sharp as something like a Super Nintendo Junior with an RGB bypass. However, I do think that Voltar is onto something that may be a universal RGB bypass for the two chip SNESs out there. Now, I don't know if there's gonna be caveats like specific two chip versions that this is gonna work with, but I think this is a great start for a lot of people, myself included, that have two chip SNESs that I've kind of written off as garbage and didn't wanna really use them because the RGB is not very sharp compared to my SNES Junior with the RGB bypass. So we're just gonna have to wait and see when Voltar kind of reveals more about this product and if it is what I think it is, then I'm gonna be excited to put one in my two chip SNES. Next, I just wanted to talk quickly about this update from Zwenergy. The files for the Wonderswan Color Consoleizer are up on this GitHub page. Now, keep in mind, this is a prototype, but it will include all the Gerber and Villa materials if you wanna order one of these boards and start assembling it yourself. Now, just know that this consoleizer is still in early days. There's a lot of information that we don't know, um, just some basic like wiring stuff and how to flash the firmware and stuff and get that set up. However, I asked Winergy if the hardware was finalized, if there's gonna be any major changes, and I don't really think there's gonna be any ma major changes. So if you wanted to start gathering some of the items for this build, like the Tang Nano 9K FPGA board, and I think there's like an Arduino Nano or something that you need, I think that it's safe to say that you can start gathering those things now. I posted a tweet last week asking if anybody was having problems with the N64 Digital and any blue retro adapters, because I was having some issues where I couldn't get controllers to connect to my N64 Blue Retro adapter on my N64 Digital modded system. And somebody mentioned that Dan was aware of some issues with Blue Retro on the N64 Digital, not necessarily in my case where controllers wouldn't connect at all, but more so where you would have rogue button presses and you know, you just have weirdness with button presses when you have a controller connected to an N64 digital system. So the bad news is there is some kind of an issue with N64 digitals and PS1 digitals specific to Blue Retro. I don't think it affects any other kind of um, compatibility with certain controllers or anything. But the good news is it sounds like there are fixes for both the N64 Digital and the PS1 Digital. I'm not gonna go too much into details about the actual hardware fix. Um, I'll leave a link in the description that Darth Cloud, who is the creator of Blue Retro, kind of goes into the issue, the exact issue. The fix that Dan has come up with is basically a new little mini flex that kind of goes onto both the flex cables for the N64 Digital and the PS1 Digital, and it has some kind of a buffer there on the controller lines. But I do wanna know if you are gonna order either of these adapters for the N64 Digital or the PS1 Digital, they don't come assembled. Basically, Dan is gonna provide you with a flex cable and a short bill of materials, so you have to order a couple of parts and solder them on yourself. So if you're having problems with Blue Retro button presses, errant button presses or anything, now Dan from PixelFX has released some flex cable fixes for both the N64 Digital and the PS1 Digital. This next tweet from Matt Buxton, AKA Video Game Perfection, actually made me pretty sad when I saw it. He's basically announcing that the OSSE project is kind of delayed I won't say it was canceled. However, it looks like there have been part shortage issues that have caused them to not be able to get all the parts needed for these OSCC Pro upscalers. Now it sounds like it is a pretty major part that they can't get, the FPGA that runs the OSCC Pro. And they can get some, I guess, but they're like in the order of $1,000 or more. It sounds like this is not gonna happen anytime soon until either they redesign for a new FPGA or some of those FPGAs come in stock at the normal price that this was supposed to come in at. So pretty sad day. The OSSC Pro was supposed to be a competitor to the RetroTank 5X as well as the Pixel FX Morph, and now we really won't be able to use it at all. There is also that OSSC Pro Lite upscaler that's floating around that uses the DE10 Nano, the same board that is used by the Mister. So you could check that out in the meantime. I'll leave a link to that project as well, but. 
I was kind of disappointed and hoping that I could actually get one of these OSSC Pros and just do comparisons between this and the RetroDrink 5X. For the big story this week, Make Megahertz has finally revealed their new Xbox mod chip and they're calling it Project Stellar. I want to first start off by saying that I'm not an Xbox expert or an expert, if you will. So feel free to flame me in the comments if I get anything wrong. Okay, first let's start off by talking about the mod chip itself. Project Stellar is going to connect to the Xbox's LPC port, but unlike other mod chips that connect to the LPC port, those mods usually just use it to boot the Xbox into a custom BIOS, whereas Project Stellar is supposed to be implementing more of that LPC port interface. For example, it can give the Xbox access to more SD RAM and static RAM, and it can give the Xbox access to two ARM cores, which can be used by the CPU to offload tasks. It has a built-in OLED screen that you can use for debugging, and it has a micro SD card slot that you can load traditional BIOSes onto. It has three expansion connectors for future upgradability, and it has a USB-C port that you can use in case you need to emergency flash a firmware update. The Project Stellar mod chip uses a modern FPGA and it has a built-in RP2040 MCU on it and that's where those two ARM CPU cores come from. One thing I wanted to point out is that there is this front panel header. Make Megahertz is gonna design one of those LCD screens that will go in the front of the Xbox that you can use to display status and things. That is kind of similar to that LCD mod I was talking about from Team Executor a few weeks ago. And not only are they gonna create their own, but they're also gonna be creating adapters so that you can use Project Stellar on those existing LCD screens from Team Executor and other mod companies. Okay, next let's talk about Stellar OS. There's actually a lot in this blog post about Stellar OS, so I'm gonna scroll down to this like TLDR section. It says that Stellar OS is the first completely legal re-implementation of the retail Xbox BIOS. It can take advantage of that additional eight megabytes of SD RAM from the Project Stellar mod board, and it seems like the kernel can be dynamically recompiled depending on basically the hardware revision that you're using, as well as any features that you're enabled. All that means that it is gonna save you memory when you compile those things for your specific hardware and you don't have things that you don't need. Additional features include automatic network-based system updating, Xbox One controller support, Titan Plus support, meaning it can support hard drives up to 16 terabytes, DVD drive bypass support, support for up to 256 megabytes of system RAM, and analog video improvements. However, the most amazing feature of Stellar OS is the ability to load ISO files directly from the hard drive, something that Make Megahertz is calling a kernel level ODE. Stellar OS can even load compressed ISO files or CISO files, which can make those large hard drives unnecessary. To put things into perspective, this is a spreadsheet of over 1400 Xbox games that have been compressed and the total file size is a little bit larger than three terabytes. So you really only need a four terabyte hard drive or SSD if you ever wanted to legally obtain the entire Xbox library. One thing to note is that Stellar OS is still in beta and it won't be out of beta until early next year. So there's gonna be a ton of other features and I'm sure I didn't talk about all the features listed on this website here. Finally, let's talk quickly about the Xbox HD Plus V2. Xbox HD Plus is an internal HDMI mod for the original Xbox and the V2 version has been redesigned to connect directly to the Project Stellar mod chip. That means that the Project Stellar mod chip is required for the Xbox HD Plus V2. However, you do get an easier install process by doing so. You won't need to patch the Xbox's BIOS because the mod chip takes care of that for you and there are less wires that you need to solder. And also the 3D printed mount has been redesigned to be easier to install. Here is a picture of the V2 Xbox HD Plus installed alongside the Project Stellar mod and I think that this is pretty clean install. I'm unsure if you're going to be able to reuse the flex cables on existing installs. I think this is a 1.6 Xbox, but it does look like there are less things soldered inside of this Xbox. You can pre-order Project Stellar and Xbox HD Plus V2 from these authorized resellers, although the Xbox HD Plus V2 is already out of stock with Castlemania but you should be able to get these directly from Make Megahertz early next year. Overall, I'm really impressed with what I'm seeing for Project Stellar here. Uh, I'm excited about a lot of the features here. I'm hoping to get my hands on an Xbox HD Plus V2 kit and some of the upgrade kits so that I can make some installation videos. That's it for this week. If you wanna suggest a news story to me, follow me on Twitter or join the Discord. If you wanna watch older Retro Money News videos, you can check out this playlist here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.